And I think that was more fun than, I mean, I yeah, I like that out in the bush and see some country and no, it was great. I mean, yep. Was, I really like that style of things for sure. We, um, you know, and, and talking about adapting to kind of this new world with COVID or whatever, uh, you know, I've been given webinars or, and, and just presentations, Zoom presentations and stuff. And um, just like where, how you, you kind of adapted and ended up finding a much better way of communicating than some, uh, at least on a level, right? Was just going from farmhouse to farmhouse. Mm -hmm. We had one and it was, um, they were like, you know, we've got YouTube videos of you, John. What I think we're gonna do is just do like an interview and you can just talk and we'll have it a back and forth thing. And it was, I like that 10 times better. I mean, nobody wants to listen to me for an hour, but it was uh, the very insightful questions and it, and, it, uh -huh. and it got a little bit deeper than just the stump speech that oftentimes I think you hear from people on the circuit, you know? Yeah. Well, speaking of the circuit, we're gonna kick things off here. I've got uh, the floodgates are open. So we've got people starting to tune in um thank you guys for welcome or thank you for tuning in welcome to our is this our third season now it's crazy that we did this that was the adaptability of you know we would have been at a bunch of conferences right now or have several of them under our belt at this point but keith and i were looking at how many were just canceled and thought well there's still got to be information out there and we still need to have some interaction from people, whether that's virtual or hopefully it'll be in person at some point. Um, we are still planning on having our conference in Iola. So if you want to connect and interact in person, we are planning on doing that March 5th and 6th. You can register for that uh, on the website. But in the meantime, we're going to kick things off on uh, our web uh, with one of the most requested topics that we've had honestly for the last two seasons which was somebody needs to talk to us about pollinators tell us about beneficial insects and uh there honestly is only one person well there's several people that come to mind but only one person that that really seems to be on the forefront of talking about beneficial insects and bold enough to uh to share that in the findings that he's got so we're gonna have Jonathan Lundgren with us tonight. But before we get into that, I'll let you guys know we're going to uh, let Jonathan go for about 45 minutes until about 6.15. And after that, we will let you guys ask your questions. So just like Jonathan said, some of the best, best part of this is the interaction and the questions of feedback. So feel free to type those questions out in the chat or the Q&A portion when we get to that point uh, around 6.15. So with that, Dale, uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce our speaker? Well, uh, there are there are some speakers that are infamous enough. They don't need a lot of introduction. We've got one with us tonight. But uh, so I, I won't belabor it. Uh, I think most people are familiar with uh, Dr. Lundgren. That's why they're on here tonight. It's why we have so many people signed up for this evening. And uh, there are there are not many people in agriculture that achieve folk hero status but we've got one with us and uh standing up to the government for what you believe is right even if it costs you everything i mean we've got somebody here who refused you you became famous jonathan because you refused to bury your research findings and, and hide them and um at some point, I think the, the whole world may owe you a debt of gratitude for that. So, uh, and if, if you want to expand upon that story, feel free. If, if, if you don't, that's fine too, but it's, it's all out there on, on the World Wide Web if people want to dig into it a little more. But welcome, we're, we're so glad to have you here and, and I'll just turn it over to you and you can take off, so. Okay, well, thank you, Dale. and. Uh... Yes, infamous is the word sometimes. We'll, we'll see how much time there is, how, how the night is going. And, um, and uh, yeah, we can get into whatever we need to get into. Um, 
I, yeah, some of this is about pollinators, I guess. A lot of it's about insects, and a lot of it is about where insects fit. And and sometimes we put our blinders on and just think, okay, entomology, you know, we're going to focus down here, right? Um, and that's not tends that doesn't tend to be what I do. I tend to focus on where insects fit into the grander system, and and so we're going to give some different perspectives on things tonight, and. Um, also, if there's questions that are very specific to pollinators, don't shy away from those. Okay, please ask at the end, and we can we can dig into that a little deeper. If I'm not touching on what you guys actually tuned in to listen to, and with that, I will share my screen, and hopefully that'll work. All right. So we're going to talk about science. We're going to talk about transformation of agriculture. Okay and uh, where bugs fit in all of that as soon as there it is. Okay, uh, this is, uh, so I'm John Lundgren. I'm a scientist, agroecologist, entomologist, but I'm also a beekeeper and I'm also a farmer and a rancher and I run Blue Dasher Farm up here in Eastern South Dakota and Ectisis Foundation, which is our research arm and uh, that's housed here. So this is my farm. Uh, the clover crop a couple of years back was uh, alive. I just love seeing that. Um, I got up in front of the beekeepers. They had me keynoting at their annual meeting. Um, wasn't this year, it was uh, 2020. And uh, one of the last meetings that I did in person. And I got up there and I said, uh, when'd your bees start dying? 2008. And okay, um, how, how much money have we spent on the bee problem? And they kind of looked around, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I said, okay, how'd your bees do last year? And the room got real quiet because we lost just as many bees last year, if not more, than we did 10, 12 years ago, right? The bees are dying. The bees are dying at a pretty alarming rate but it isn't a bee problem, okay? <laughs> and the reason that they're still dying is because we were treating it like a bee problem. And there's a lot of powers at play that want you to think this is just a bee problem. And it's much bigger than a bee problem. Um, we're losing life on this planet. The, uh, we're living through one of the worst mass extinction events that the planet has ever experienced, right? We're not just losing species, we're losing habitats. We're draining the wetlands, right? Uh, where did the prairie go? Much of that's gone now, but we're losing entire insect communities, birds, bats, bees, butterflies, all of these things. The FAO likes to cite, uh, or a lot of people like to cite this, um, statistic that we've got about 55, 60 years left of topsoil. But what they forget is that we are losing species at a rate that in 50 years, most of life on earth is going to be gone. So it's not just a soil thing, it's all life. And where goes the life on this planet, so go we. So we've got a, there's a real sense of urgency right now. We got to make some changes. Green cover seed is a part of that solution. So is the Gdysis Foundation. Central problem is not soybeans. Sometimes how we produce soybeans. That's the problem. Agriculture has become too simplified. Okay, we've got to be diversifying our food systems. Um, large monocultures, where, where a lot of the goal is to eliminate a lot of life from your farm. Um, but what we forget is that that life does things. Biodiversity and species aren't just good because we like species. It's because life does things. It, it controls pests. It, it restricts plant communities. So it allows, or it re regulates weeds, fertilizes the plants. It cycles nutrients in the soil. It's where soil comes from, right? That's where life, that's what life does. And when you eliminate the life from your farm, you have to replace it. You have to replace it with the jug. And uh, the more you use, the more you need. So when you have a monoculture, there's really only one 
way that you contain the productivity of that monoculture over a long period of time. And that's by buying agrochemicals. And the more, yeah, these things are having uh, adverse effects on your system. And you don't have to hate agrochemicals. I don't. Um, I don't use them. I'm just too cheap. I don't want to spend the money on something I don't need. And so I'd rather do it for free. And so that's why we've been, that's how we run Blue Dash or up here. Um, so there's consequences and there's consequences of the ways that we're maintaining this monoculture in ways that we had no idea, okay? Um, for instance, insecticidal seed treatments, neonicotinoids. Um, you guys have probably heard this name. Uh, you'll see trade names, what, Poncho, Cruiser, Gaucho, these sorts of things. Those are seed treatments on there and it has insecticide. But insecticides don't just hurt insects. They're not just killing the bees. What we're finding is that they're getting into the water and they're getting into the soil and they're getting taken up by plants that were never treated before. Um, several years back now, uh, a friend of a friend contacted that friend, uh, a colleague up on campus, John Jenks, and um, said that they were having problems with the white-tailed deer in Montana. 70% of these deers had these weird jaw deformities that they've never really seen before. And the male genitalia of the deer was also deformed, about 70% of them. It was a huge, huge issue in this community. And so they asked, they asked us to investigate a little bit. And so we got a graduate student, Elise um, Hughes-Berheim, who did an absolutely wonderful job on this, an incredibly difficult study to run on many different levels. What we decided to test was whether or not neonicotinoid seed treatments, insecticides, were hurting white-tailed deer in captivity. So we raised these deer, we administered um, neonix, imidacloprid in this case, to the deer in their water. And we monitored their health and progress over this period of time. Some of the things that we found, um, the dead fawns ended up having a heck of a lot more imidacloprid in their spleens. And the spleen was the magic organ in this study. It seemed to correlate extremely well. The, no, the amount of neonicotinoid in the spleen was a really strong indicator of many different fitness parameters that we were observing. But, and the more imidacloprid that you found in the spleen was associated with a lot of different detrimental things in the white-tailed deer. The fawn body weight was significantly reduced. Fawn organ weights were reduced. Fawn thyroid hormone levels were reduced. And those hormones are really important. They have a lot of downstream effects that we're not expecting, and they're really difficult to predict. Fawn jawbone lengths were disrupted. And the deer slowed down the more they had in their stomachs or in their spleens, the more imidacloprid. What's a slow deer in the, or in the wild? It's a dead deer, right? We got, you know, a little pushback on that. Um, everybody wanted to know, well, you know, that's in captivity, right? What's happening in the wild? I mean, you force fed those deer imidacloprid, right? So this is what we were able to generate under controlled conditions. This was the quantity of imidacloprid that we were able to generate in the spleens of our deer. North Dakota sent us a whole bunch of deer, hundreds of deer um, from their, uh, from hunters. And they sent us the spleens and we looked in those. They had three times the level that we were able to generate and producing all of those adverse effects in our deer. Minnesota just sent us 800 deer spleens. Between 60 and 100% had neonicotinoids in their, in their spleens. We just got bobcats, fishers, river otters from North Dakota. Between 15 and 30% of these top predators had neonics in their spleens. 
They're working in incredibly low quantities. They're having adverse effects that we couldn't predict with the new risk assessments. And they're affecting the environment. The current approach to how we're raising crops. Yes, we can grow this. Actually, this, this cornfield was, uh, was near green cover seed. It was a, um, this was part of Claire Lacan's study that uh, was one of the first things that brought me down to Bladen, Nebraska. Um, we can grow 14 foot cornfields, but look at the soil underneath that. This wasn't Heath and Brian's fields, by the way. Um, it's it, that looks like the face of the moon down there. It's like there's nothing growing in that soil, right? That's corn grown on chemotherapy. It's not, it, it worked for a while. Okay, it's not working as well anymore. Uh, our current approach to applied science isn't working anymore. It's, it's kind of starting to, I don't know, uh, it, it's giving us incremental gains to a broken system. Um, our current approach to food production is starting to, to break down. You know, this whole idea of large monocultures and commodities rather than growing food is, is really important for us to re be rethinking now. Our current approach to beekeeping isn't working. Some of the biggest beekeepers in Nebraska, um, good friends of mine, all pulled their hives out of Nebraska. They said we can't, we, most of them die. We aren't putting our bees in Nebraska anymore. We have to find places where cropland isn't quite as pervasive. And that's where they're ending up putting a lot of their bees. This isn't the hobbyist, you know, this is the, the commercial guy. They can't keep in business in, in places like Nebraska anymore. I was driving, you know, I mean, I worked in the system for a long time. My research at USDA was used to, you know, searching for that next three bushel yield bump to try to keep the corn and soybean working. And I was working for farmers and I thought I was doing a good job. And then I could, and then I drove, you know, from Eastern South Dakota down to Iowa. I was giving a talk and it's like, you know, what we've done here, there's two plants. Yellow is corn and green is soybeans. There's two plants out there and in hundreds of miles. That's wrong. I'm not saying the food production is wrong. I'm not saying the farmers are wrong. I'm not saying the corn and soybeans are wrong, but how we're producing that is having effects on, on things that we're never supposed to be. And we need to rethink that a little bit. This is almonds. This is where I'm heading in about three weeks. Um, that, is, that is the Central Valley of California. Almost all of it looks like that. Science has to re, we have to rethink science. You know, we have to rethink how we're, where scientists fit into that community again. We need to figure out how science can be applied, not to incremental evolutionary steps, right? But to macro evolutionary steps, we need an asteroid to hit. <laughs> and science needs to be applied differently. Um, we need to stop focusing on incremental progress and symptoms, and we need to develop new systems. And that's what we're, how we're trying to apply our science up here at Ecdysis Foundation. Funding for science. We need to, yep, we need to be, yeah, there's a smaller and smaller pot of money for funding innovative research in agriculture, and more and more hands are reaching into that shrinking pot. We need to, and then, uh, so what it ends up doing is it leaves the only, um, you know, sources of easy money come from large corporations. And large corporations end up controlling naming rights on the new university buildings, and they control the dialogue by, by dangling the money and the science, scientists chase after it. Um, so this is a problem. This is a problem too. We need to we need to reconnect our, or fund the kinds of science that we need done in order to drive social change. And one of the things that we've been really passionate about at Ecdysis Foundation is we need to rethink how scientists measure their success. Because I can tell you, 
I worked in that system for a long time, the scientific infrastructure, the matrix. <clears throat> I was damn good at it, right? I could list all of the th ways that I could tell you I was good at it. You know, I had scientific peer-reviewed papers, right? Hundreds of them. Millions in grants, right? I got patted up and down, you know, uh, on my back by up and down my supply or my chain of command. It was wonderful. Half of that money ends up going into the into the bureaucracy. It doesn't go to the research. I had a puppy mail, man. We were pumping out students, postdocs. It was great. How many committees I was serving on? Gosh, I was so involved in so many different aspects of the scientific uh, infrastructure. And then I kind of looked back and I looked at this list and I'm like, how many of these things do farmers care about? Zero, <laughs> all right? So the metrics of success for farming are much different than the metrics of success for science. And our science is produced for other scientists and not so often for the farmers anymore. And that's a huge problem. But the only way that you get a job in science is by adhering to that. We end up um, science and agriculture, I think, self-perpetuating. But so for us, I got out. Uh, I quit. We started Dice. We started Blue Dasher Farm. We want science that would change the world. There has to be relationships. There has to be connections. We have to become farmers. And when that happens, it changed all the different questions that we were asking and how we were asking them. Um, we're focused on acres changed. Yes, we still have period science, but it's how we communicate that science that really matters to us. And it's not communicated to the scientific community as often as it is making darn sure that the farming community can use it. So the solution to the problem is that we really need to change the whole culture of food. Anything less and your bees, your insects are gonna to continue to die. Um, but what's so enheartening is that there's a lot of farmers that are doing that. They're doing just that. And I'll bet a lot of them are on this call right now. Um, they didn't know it at the time, but I started meeting these wacko farmers and uh, uh, they didn't call themselves regenerative at the, at the time, but they really were the forerunners of the regenerative movement. This was, this regenerative agriculture is really driven by the farming community, not by the scientists, not by policymakers. We're trying to catch up. Farmers are leading this one. Anyways, change is happening. It's happening very rapidly. Change to science is happening very rapidly. I'll be darned. Um, this is Blue Dasher Farm. Ecdysis Foundation is housed right here. Um, so if you're ever in the area, stop by. We'd love to show you around. Um, what we wanted was to kind of do a, a, a national scale scientific project to drive regenerative ag, supply the sorts of data that are necessary in order to change our food culture. And um, we've adapted, we've evolved, we've grown. Um, and our identity is clear, clearer than it ever has been before. And, and the need for what we are doing has become more and more clear, at least to us. Regen ag, what is first off, stop tilling the soil, um, reduce or abandon agrochemicals, I think is another one that's not on this list. I don't think you need them anymore when you go regenerative. Never leave bare soil. Um, always have living roots in the ground. Cover crops are really central part of this. Okay. Some plant diversity is better than none and more plant diversity is better than less. And then we also need to be integrating livestock back with our crop plant. We partitioned our food system into livestock, ranches and, and crops. And those belong in the same place. There's a lot of ways of doing that. So we can make agriculture friendly to life again. Um, 
Well, this was a really important study. Claire Lacan did this back in 2018 and actually uh, Bladen, Nebraska is represented in this study as one of the, the sets of regen, uh, regenerative farms. Um, in one day, this study kind of went to the top 1% of all science ever written in terms of social media. Um, why? Uh, well, uh, because it was systems focused, it was best management focused from a farmer's perspective. It was the first time in the peer reviewed literature, the primary literature, where we ever tried to compare regenerative and, and conventional agriculture um, to see what was happening with it. <clears throat> so, with, you know, Regen Ag, uh, those systems vary in the practices that they employ to, a, uh, to attain those principles. And so the practices on these different cornfields were different, but they were unified in a few things. Number one is that none of the regenerative agriculture farms had, had insecticides used. And all of the conventional cornfields used genetically modified crops, BT corn to control insect pests, and they were all treated with neonicotinoid seed treatment. So they all had insecticides on them. So here's some of the results. Oh no, that's not results yet. We went out there, right? We looked at all the insect community that we could find. We sucked up, uh, we cut down plants and, and sucked up any insects that we were finding on the, on the plants themselves. Uh, we got down on our hands and knees and sucked up any insects on the soil surface. And then we drilled down into the soil and the column. And um, we pulled up and, and found any insects that were living in the soil too. Um, and then we looked at yields and profits on these different cornfields. So this was a while ago, right? Um, geez, I wanna say 20, 2015, I think is when we did this work. And, you know, I mean, you can look at the meteoric rise of cover crop adoption Things have changed a lot. We've learned a lot in the last five, six years in terms of all of this stuff. So this was pretty early on for these farms. Uh, insecticide treated corn fields had 10 times more pests. That wasn't supposed to happen, right? We were investing in pest control uh, because we were told that pests were inevitable. Yeah. But that wasn't the case here. They didn't, the regen farms didn't just abandon their pesticides, right? They replaced them. They replaced them with good farming ma management practices. They used uh, a diversity. They all used cover crops. They got plants into their environment. And by doing that, they, they were able to reduce their pests below anything that we could do chemically. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, oops. Oops, what's going on? All right, pests. There was pests. Okay. Um, profit of cornfield, but profits were twice as high. Why was that? Because, number one, they regen folks um, abandon their or reduce their seed costs substantially. They reduced their fertilizer costs substantially, and they also uh, marketed their products a little bit differently. Some of them just sold them to the coop, but a lot of them would uh, sell, the, sell the corn to their communities, or they had animal operations that they would sell directly to. So they eliminated the middleman that was driving down their profits. So um, that makes it a good business decision, doesn't it? <laughs> Not regen isn't just a isn't just this ide ideological belief system that drives us. It's because a farm should be a business, right? And yields are not the focus always. Profits should be. We looked at it. There was no there was no correlation between yields and profits on these cornfields. 
because guys were chasing yields so hard that they were spending a lot more money in order to attain that. And so their profits were actually lower. Um, but you want to know what was did scale really well with with the uh, profit was how much soil organic matter they had generated on their farm. We should be giving awards for that. How much soil you've grown on your farm because it pays. It pays for itself. Okay. Cornfields. It works in all of the different systems that we've worked in. We're working from Saskatchewan down to Kansas, from Michigan out to California now. And in all of these instances, we see very similar results. Okay. California almonds. Uh, most of the nation's bees head out to the almonds to pollinate them. They drive them out there on trucks. So anything we do to save the bees up in the upper Midwest where they spend their summers um, is completely negated when they go out to, to uh, California almonds. Um, there I was uh, standing next to some hives that one of my friends was operating out there. Um, the almond orchard paid him a pretty penny for all of his bees. And as we were watching there, the helicopter with the spray was hosing down and killing his bees just as we were standing there, spraying fungicides on them. And uh, yeah, that's a different perspective, isn't it? That's a very real thing. These, uh, the pesticide impacts on our pollinators is very real. So we asked whether or not there was a better way. Tommy Fenster entered in. Uh, we're just submitting his paper from this work right now. Uh, he's just about got his master's degree. Um, but he asked a simple question that was very difficult to answer. Uh, are regenerative almond systems superior to conventional almond systems? And many people, when we talk to them out in California about you know, regen ag and regen almonds, they said soil health might work where you live, but it doesn't work in our system. So we had to prove it. Um, we focused on two systems in the northern half of the Central Valley. Um, and this is not photoshopped. This is actually two farms in our experiment. One on the right is a conventional farm. This is what most of the Central Valley of California looks like. Bare soil um, and, and trees so that, that, I mean, that's a monoculture, right? On the left is a more regenerative operation. There's no pesticides used over there. They use perennial ground covers to always have living roots out there. They use composts and compost teas. And then they also, some of them even integrated livestock, sheep or cows or chickens. Soil organic matter was 30% higher on the Regen almonds. Water, water is so important in California right now. Each almond requires one to two gallons of water to produce each nut, and they're growing them in a desert. <laughs> so, water is a huge, huge issue. Water infiltration, or water infiltrated the soil six times faster in the regen fields. Life was just crazy in these fields. There was so much more life out there. This is just the biomass of, of critters on the soil. But pest populations were exactly the same. When we produced, presented this to one of our um, producers, the conventional producers, he kind of looked at the data and he's like, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I did everything I was supposed to do. I, I, I followed the best management practices as laid out by the universities in the state and, and my crop advisors all told me, and I sprayed insecticides on my trees five times, cost me tens of thousands of dollars. And what you're telling me is that the guy right across the road from me who didn't spray at all had the same number of pests. And he wouldn't believe it. But we got through to him and he transferred uh, 160 acres over to regenerative almonds this year. In fact, he'll hopefully be part of our study of uh, that we're expanding this work out on 
now to include uh, the transition phase and how quickly you can get to regen. Yields were exactly the same in the two systems. So you didn't hit, get a yield drag in almonds just by going regenerative. So you, no matter what, even if the price premiums aren't there for regen, you still will see the same profit as you did before. But the profit on the regen was actually twice as high, just like in corn. We're seeing this pop up again and again, okay? Oh, let's see, where are we at? We got 10 minutes. Um, I'll thank people, you know, okay. So why is it, I'll thank people at the end. Um, why is it that regenerative agriculture isn't the mainstream? Why isn't everybody just doing this, right? Well, what we're talking about is a paradigm shift and, and change is hard. And then also, I think just like I was outlining late earlier is that science is kind of misdirected on agriculture right now. It's being used to support a broken system rather than innovate it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not always easy being a scientist, right? We were watching, my kids and I were watching Cosmos um, and, and they were, uh, you know, it's this Neil deGrasse Tyson show and they go through the history of science or whatever. And so and so, you know, he discovered that light refracts in a certain way and and it really changed the way we think about, uh, you know, the sun and the stars and where we fit in the universe and and uh, really advanced our understanding of telescopes and stuff. And so they killed him and chopped off his hands and burned him at the stake. and. My kids' eyes just get wider as we're watching this show. And every episode is like that, right? Whenever you've got these paradigm shifts, you know, usually there's martyrs involved. And, uh, and there's really no incentive for, for being uh, uh, sticking your neck out and investigating controversial scientific issues. And science, quite frankly, isn't perfect. You know, it's fallible but it is the best thing that we've got. No, there is no perfect study. A perfect scientific study has never been conducted. And I personally was really interested in finding truth about my own life and about the world around me. And then I turned to science for that and, um, and discovered that science doesn't do that. Science provides understanding, but it doesn't always provide truth. Proof, proof, that's math, that's not science. And so science is gray. Science isn't black and white. Science is human. A big part of science is belief systems and the people who are investigating things. Well, that's important, that's important to know. Um, but at the same time, the way that we conduct studies allows for much greater understanding than without it. And so we need to have good science. Um, science is also manipulated um, right now and always ha it has been for a long, long time. It's kind of formalized actually. If you wanna learn more about it, there's a, some really good documentaries. Um, uh, Naomi Oreskes has a, has a good book called Merchants of Doubt. And um, also, the, uh, there's a Netflix movie about that by the, the same name, Merchants of Doubt, worth, worth a watch. Essentially, the tobacco industry really helped to kind of formalize this. I mean, they convinced the American public and public around the world for decades that, you know, uh, cigarettes don't harm human health. <laughs> it's like, how on earth did they do that? Um, well, three easy steps. Um, first off, um, you know, there, the science is gray. It's not black and white. And so when you get a study that's kind of questioning your agenda, all you have to do is, is um, point out all of the flaws. It's not hard to do. So you start saying that's junk. That science is junk. And, uh, and so you start, people start to dismiss it. And... Um, Becomes a question then next is, uh, uh, so if, if that's the case, then how do we make decisions based on science? Well, 
you you repeat studies under different circumstances and eventually you become you get consistent results right and um you know, maybe you change the types of questions that you're asking to try to flesh out the truth a little bit deeper or understanding a little bit deeper science is expensive who can fund the preponderance of evidence Biggest pocketbooks in the room usually are the ones that have the strongest agendas for why you don't want an insecticide study to come out, for example. And so you fund things that obscure the results. You fund things that, that obscure the dialogue. Right? It's, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, you, you, you say, no, you know, my, our product clearly from all of these studies doesn't have any effect on white-tailed deer, right? And then sometimes it, it doesn't work, right? You still get these ideological scientists that don't shut up. Then what do you do? Well, you destroy them. You destroy them, you destroy their families, you destroy everybody that they care about. And then you put their cold dead corpse on a stake where everybody gets to see it. And no other scientist asks that question again. Happens every day, happens in the universities, happens in the federal system. Um, that's the way science works. It ain't pretty sometimes. Why do we think Varroa mite is killing the honeybees? Turns out poisoned, starving bees get sick. And so we have, uh, we have a situation where the Varroa mite is, is actually a, um, a symptom of a greater problem. And there's no shortage of funds if you want to study the Varroa mite and how, what's being, and how, it's, how it's affecting the bees, you can get money to do that. But if you want to study the impacts of insecticides on the bees, that's a different story altogether. And then finally, science is necessary, but it is not sufficient for solving problems. I wish we were a data-driven society sometimes more, but that isn't always necessarily the case. So data does not necessarily drive, change behavior on its own. Look at that dapper young fella, huh? There's a little bit more hair on that guy's head, I think, but still darn good looking if you ask me, right? I was doing everything right, everything right. I had a whole group of students, postdocs, publications up the yin yang, grants, millions. I was advising the EPA, the European Food Safety Authority. I received a, an award from President Obama in the White House for being one of the top young scientists in the country. Everything was going right. And then I met these jerks and they said, John, the pesticides are killing our bees. I said, no, no, the data is inconclusive. It's great, it's not black and white. And they said, come on out and watch our bees die. Then you tell us that the science or that the that this data isn't conclusive, and uh, and they were right. I came out, I went out, and I watched the bees die, <laughs> and the pesticides were killing the bees. So we started publishing on that, and that got a lot of people upset <laughs> in my chain of command. Uh, they didn't care for that and they were getting harassed by industry. And then finally, uh, we also started to question the whole system, right? We said, you know, maybe this is actually a, a, a over investing in one crop isn't a good idea. There's nothing wrong with corn, but let's look at this and think about it because it could be a real national security threat. And they said, no, nope, you gotta take your name off of that. You're not allowed to say anything bad about corn. And you're not allowed to say that the bees are dying because of pesticides or the monarchs are being killed by pesticides anymore. Don't talk about that anymore. And finally, I said, enough, enough, I quit. And we started something totally different. 
Um, that's what Blue Dasher Farm is. It's meant to, to, to be the kinds of science, to ask the tough questions that other people aren't allowed to. Um, and it's had an, more of an impact in the last five years than I could have ever dreamed of having within my old position. So really exciting time. All right, I think I'm just about towards the end here. Um, I would not be here if it was not for just an amazing group of uh, enthusiastic colleagues that continues to grow. It's crazy. Um, and if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us, Blue Dasher Farm is on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. And uh, Ecdysis Foundation is our 501c3. This kind of work doesn't fund itself. If you want to see this kind of science being done more, um, consider making a tax-free donation. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. We can discuss things a little bit more if there's questions or thoughts. My gosh, there's a lot of people on there. Holy moly, did I just get myself in a whole heap of hot water maybe? <laughs> I don't think so. We've got, uh, yeah, if you guys have your questions that you want to get in, you can start typing those out in the Q&A or the chat. I do have one through email was, uh, do you have any suggestions for managing cucumber beetles in market garden setting? And that was something that um, obviously wasn't touched on in this presentation, but if you want to have kind of address that real quick. Sure. Um, let's see. So cucumber beetles, um, they are specialists on, on, on cucurbits. Um, get some polycultures going out there, get covers on the ground, do not have bare soil. That's the first step in this process. Um, and uh, planting trap crops, things like that, that you can remove would be another option. There's certain pumpkin varieties, I think, that are really attractive. Um, getting flowers out there for natural enemies and, and just increasing the diversity in and around your cucumber plots is, is a valuable thing. Market garden. So is that like a like a community garden kind of scenario? Because a lot of times they don't understand cover crops and they kind of start getting a little uh, upset about that. But we need to be indoctrinating them into that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the, the context of this question, Jody. So there might be a, a follow up. But uh, Jody asks, I'm doing a cover crop study and would like to add a pollinator component. I was reading some articles for methods and saw a five minute observation time and counting number of beneficials, your thoughts. Yeah, let's see the, um, so for assessing pollinator populations, how we roll with that is, uh, you know, the five minute direct observations, we don't get the kind of numbers that we like. Some people use them and they do a great job for them. Uh, we ended up going, we like sweep samples. We like bee bowls, so you end up using different um, colored bowls that you put out there with a little um, detergent in it, and then any bees that come calling end up uh, going into those. There's also things called blue vein traps that we really enjoy using. Those are good for larger bees like bumblebees. Um, can get a little expensive if you're doing them in mass, but all of those are good pollinator approaches. Okay. Uh, on Facebook, May asks, are you looking for more farms to be a part of your research hub? Uh, yeah. Is that, that something that you're always looking for? Um, we're embarking on what we're calling the Thousand Farm Initiative, where we want to be on a thousand farms demonstrating full site inventories across the nation and different. Um, so yes, uh, reach out via email if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, so that okay. would be a great opportunity. So I'm going to leave you the question about, you know, I'm in arid land, in arid southwest to the green cover guys, because they kind of know that uh, what, what seeds are available and how much they cost. But in general, what you're after, even in the arid areas of the country, you are after diversity. You want flowers of different colors, different sizes, shapes, structure within that plant community. Um, all of those things are really, really important. Gail, do you have any uh, insights on that one or do you want to leave that one for a different time? What's that? Do you want to address that as far as um, beneficial insect habitat cover crops species for zone nine in the arid yeah, southwest? Yeah, um, 
Well, I mean, you can jump in, Jonathan, if you want to. Uh, uh, depends a lot on whether it's warm season or cool season. Um, but uh, phacelia, any of the clovers, I mean, things that flower, buckwheat. Um, in zone nine, buckwheat probably work either cool season or warm season. Uh, flax is pretty good. Um, the, the sweet clover spectrum. Uh, Hugh Bam sweet clover is uh, very, very effective in bringing in uh, pollinators and, and bees. Uh, Jonathan, help me out here. What am I omitting? You know, I think um, something that we often forget is uh, how important grasses are. We just published a study that showed that um, grass pollen ends up being about 78% of the, of the pollen DNA within a bee's stomach, a honeybee's stomach. And that's been echoed now time and again uh, over the last several weeks or months in the scientific literature. It's kind of this weird bolus of papers that's like, no, bees need grass pollen. Bees need fungal spores, things like that. They're, um, they're more, they don't just go to flowers. Yeah, yeah that, that was pretty, uh, it was like 78%, something just it was crazy how much. Yeah. The percent of pollen that came from grasses, it was astounding. Yeah. I, just, I was floored. You know, that's yeah. not what we've been taught for years. No, it's not. No, it's not. But I do think it just speaks to that diversity, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, a friend of mine uh, was down in Arkansas, has a graduate student who's just finishing up, and they found all, uh, when corn is pollinating, that's one of the dominant pollen sources that comes into those hives. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a question, and I had the same question, actually, about squash bugs. Those things are an absolute, the bane of my existence whenever I try to grow pumpkins or squash. Yeah. Um, there's some pumpkin varieties that I think are less susceptible to them or more attractive to them. You can use those as trap crops for your squash bug infestations. Um, I don't know how many people actually incorporate covers into their squash and cucurbit pop, uh, plots, but I do think that that's really important. Um, yeah. what, what about uh, natural predators of squash bugs? Anything, I mean, yeah. wolf spiders, yeah. crab spiders? All of those things like to eat them. General as predators, I don't know the natural enemy community specifically for squash bugs, but I do know that um, that there are things that eat them. We just have to figure out and give those animals an opportunity to kind of take hold. Yeah. And I, I see someone was asking about a, a pecan orchard. And... Yeah. Um, we're going to hopefully be working in pecans soon. Let's see. Uh, in a regenerative model, but I wanted the, the landowner to stop the harvester from the practice of spraying. I had the landowner on board, but the harvester told them spraying pesticides and fungicides are required. Pecans cannot be grown effectively organically. Uh, that's a load of crap. Um, we, we I have heard a pecan specialist at University Extension say that very same thing. I have no doubt. I have no doubt uh, until you meet farmers that are doing it. Um, so we're really interested in exploring this as one of our next systems um, where we look at pecans in Oklahoma and, and Kansas and, uh, and uh, see whether or not regenerative uh, pecan orchards can be as successful as every place else that we've Now, made. I uh, just to, to add on to that, on the number of fruit and nut trees, it seems like incorporating pigs or chickens or some livestock eliminates a lot of the need for spraying because the insect infested fruit falls on the ground gets eaten right and so, so ground cover is really protein. important yeah ground ground cover is really important in orchard system um, and that's your first line of defense you need life in your soil a lot of the orchard pests end up um, you know, I mean, they force the fruit to abort in a lot of cases, and the and the uh, that abortion of the of the crop is 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 the tree's attempt 
to void itself, right? It would get that nut out of there that's got the pest in it because underneath those trees, there was things like pigs and chickens and other animals were foraging into there. And, and so that was easy pickings for them. But when we eliminated livestock from our systems and our orchards, um, the pests were able to just keep on cycling and cycling and cycling. It gets back to that notion of, of, of eliminating life on our farm and then trying to replace it with, with some technology, you know? And, and life is just really good at that. Just reading the book, Restoration Agriculture, and the author was was talking about how um, he worked at an apple orchard when he was younger, when he was a teenager, and the guy raised Macintosh apples, and he was the only person around who could successfully raise Macintosh apples without mm -hmm. it being just torn up with scab. And the way he did it is he pastured hogs and cattle mm -hmm. underneath the trees. And the pigs ate the scab infested apples and the, the cows ate the scab infested leaves. Wow. And they also trimmed the trees up as far as they could reach so that the scab organisms during rainfall splash would never hit on the, <laughs> the leaves were up too high because the cattle trimmed them up. And, and wow. I thought, what a beautiful system. Not only do you get, uh, internally apple flavored bacon but yeah you don't have to spray for scab either yeah it's a great a great opportunity yeah. increases the resilience of your whole farm uh stewart says speaking as an organic farmer certified through the regenerative organic certification program i'm finding a challenge to balance the rise in perennial weeds with the reduction in tillage intensity it seems easier to incorporate these five regenerative principles with selective herbicide use do you have any thoughts on that yeah um so that's something, we, yeah, at Blue Dasher, we contend with a lot. I mean, we plant our annual crops in the perennial warm season grasses. We basically farm the prairie and we don't use herbicides and we don't use tillage. So we don't have a lot of tools at our disposal, do we? Um, what we end up doing is, um, and this is unfortunately uh, too often the case in organic systems is that they, they don't have a livestock component. And those livestock are really, really important, um, especially in organic systems um, in order to regulate the plant community. We also use fire in our system. So once every three years, we'll burn a field and then that allows us to kind of get in there. And then we also don't, um, we don't annually, we don't crop every single field every year. Some of those fields are given a year long rest or, or, or grazed um, for just a year. And so that, um, that gives us opportunities for using our ground. So I guess I would, I would urge, you know, the use of covers as competitors. Um, I would urge the use of livestock and, and, and in our case, fire is also another really important tool. Um. Here's, here's something that I hear all the time. Um, spraying sugar. I, I always hear that insects don't have a pancreas, so they cannot process sugar. Um, can you address that? Uh, I, I hear that about spraying sugar will kill alfalfa weevil because it um, process sugar. No, I don't think that that's true. Uh, Sugar does a number of things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, we tried it for soybean aphids and it really didn't help. Um, but other people have shown that it helps in corn if you're spraying sweet corn or something like that with sugar. Um, what it does is uh, it can affect the physiology of the host plant a little bit. Um, and so it may, may affect the nitrogen balance of that host plant. Um, but it also uh, attracts a lot of natural enemies. So things like ants and lady beetles all come in to get the sugar, and um, and then they stick around, hopefully, and eat some of the eat some of the pests. But uh, no, the idea that insects can't eat sugar is is not correct. Okay, 
uh, Greg asks, is the neonic treatment on non-GMO corn still detrimental when using finger pickup planter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, it is. Okay. You don't need it either. It's not helping you in any way. So ditch it. You can save a lot of money. We have a problem with leaf, leaf hoppers as a vector of a virus in our hemp crop. Any suggestions? Oh, gosh. I haven't worked much in hemp yet. Um, covers. You know, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but, you know, I mean, these principles really work in a lot of these different systems. Uh, intercropping. Um, I don't know the hemp system very well, though, so I, I'm not sure how it's grown, what kind of row spacings and all of that, and, and what's it. Yeah. It's not perennial, is it? I don't believe so, but I'll, we'll see if she responds back. Um, I will take this last question here. I know we're at 630, but uh, Mike McDonald said, John, we drilled a 15 inch pollinator strip around 100 acre soybean field this year. They incorporated various sections on marginal lands using um, green covers pollinator mix, as well as our hunting mix. What is happening to the bees and the beneficials in this buffer during November through April when that cash crop, uh, which was beans without treatment in 2020, will we have corn or we will have corn. We're trying to find non-treated seed, but in 2021, thus planning for the second year, good presentation. So I think the question is, is basically what, what happens to those beneficial insects that you had in that buffer um, kind of during the winter time in November through April? So if it's a 15 footer, then, you know, I mean, there's a lot of overwintering that goes on in there. Um, and not everything is going to overwinter in there, but I think it's good habitat. Uh, so leave it if you can. The more perennial habitat that you have in and around your farm, I think it really benefits a lot of species. Um, so yeah, uh, whether the bees are overwintering in there, it will depend on the soil structure and all of that. Those would be the native bees. Um, primarily not the managed bees. Those are, yeah, unless you've got honeybees there, I'm not sure. So you hear from you, Mike, been a long time. You mentioned that it was a, you know, 15 feet is maybe wide enough. Do you recommend wider strips longer? Is there any kind of a preference on when people are putting in those pollinator plots on what that should look like, or does it really make a difference? Um, plan as much as you can. Okay. <laughs> That's what I always advocate for. So you've got, yeah, if you're farming ma marginal areas on your farm or something, little low areas that normally you'd even think about draining, don't do that. Um, plant it to pollinator mixes and stuff like that and back off on your insecticide use in your adjacent corn to make up the money that you're losing from that marginal piece of ground. Okay. Well, with that, um, we'll wrap up. Thank you guys so much for the questions, for your time. Jonathan, we really appreciate that. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. We did record it, so it will be up on YouTube and on our website here later this week. In the meantime, we've got Keith Thompson and Josh Lloyd next week. We're going to do kind of a farmer panel, so hope to see you guys all next week. And with that, Jonathan, do you have any uh, final words for us? No, no, it's an exciting time. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of gloom and doom that gets put out there, but it's also a very hopeful time. So be part of the change. Yep. I might just add for anybody who joined after the introduction, we are still planning on having our March 5th and 6th conference in Iola, Kansas. We got the, the indoor cover crop plot planted over the weekend. So we will have green live growing plants, barring any screw up of mine between now and then. So we'll knock on wood there. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you everyone for tuning in and thank we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Take care. Thank you very much.